The following program presents theories about an historical event that is shrouded in mystery. It contains archival footage, reenactments, and dramatizations, which invite you, the viewer, to draw your own conclusions. Nearly 40 years ago, on an early December evening, something strange is spotted in the sky above the village of Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. What does it look like? It looked like a on fire. Radiating off for the back or side was a blue light, much like a welder's light. Something went across the sky, it was just like a big fireball, and it plunged into the ground. It, it scared me. It really scared me. Come down out of the clouds, my daughter and I both saw it at the same time. Some believe they have witnessed a UFO crash. They say local officials and the military tried to conceal the mysterious object. There was army trucks, cars, they had the rifles, all kind of military people that were coming in. The military walked up in front of my car. I was told not to go into the woods. But since 1965, the U.S. government has maintained that nothing at all came down outside Kecksburg. Others contend that natural science can account for the eyewitness reports. What people saw was uh, a very bright fireball meteor over Lake Erie. Now, this was an intensely bright object. Why do people have so many different interpretations of the same event? The Project Blue Book file on the event basically said that the search continued to about 2 a.m., that nothing was found. Skeptics claim these explanations are part of a conspiracy to cover up the truth. Something landed, or something came down through those trees and, and, and hit the ground. Why wouldn't our own government come out and tell us that was a satellite or a missile, it was Russian, or one of our own? Now I'm beginning to wonder what it actually was. So what was so important down in those woods that the military didn't want those people to see? These are American citizens who deserve this information, who have every right to this information. Right down through here, right down through here. See, this wasn't here, this is all grown in. This was an open field like this. And I went down. 79-year-old Bill Bullybush is a lifelong resident of the Kecksburg area. For more than 20 years, he kept a secret from his neighbors in this small rural community. That one December night, he believes he saw an unidentified flying object over Kecksburg. Little did he know that many of his fellow citizens believe they saw the same thing. No way can change my mind. I know what I'm saying, and that, that was it. December 9th, 1965. It's about 4.30 p.m., just before sunset in Kecksburg, which is about 45 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. Bill Bullybush has just come home from work. As his wife prepares dinner, Bullybush heads outside to work on his pride and joy, a 1964 Chevy Corvair. He listens to the car's CB radio while he tinkers under the dash. And I heard guys in Ohio talking on there, and they were jabbering, they were coming east. And they, they said that they seen this thing too going east, you know, and they wondered what it was. Bullybush suddenly hears a hissing sound. He looks up, catching a glimpse of a glowing object in the sky. To get a better look, he gets out of his car and can plainly see the bright object overhead. Yeah, I, I watched it, and it, it was just like a big fireball. Then it was headed towards the mountain. And it come back a pretty good piece, and the first thing I know, it made a U-turn and went down into Kecksburg, down in the woods there. Less than two miles away, 
16-year-old Robert Blystone sits on the back porch of his parents' home. He also spots the strange light. It was just a round fireball. You know, flames all around it with these different color vapors behind it. And it just started slowing down like it was being controlled. And the next thing I know, it's beyond the hill where I can't see it no more, but I, then I start seeing like smoke, dust coming up out of the woods. So I kind of fear it kind of crashed. Across town, Bill Bullybush jumps into his Corvair and drives to the Kecksburg woods. At the top of the hill overlooking the woods, Bully Bush stops, then turns on his parking lights so he can see into the valley. A strong smell of sulfur permeates the air. As Bully Bush makes his way down the hill, he hears a sizzling sound. I could see it down in the valley there, and uh, that's, that's where it, it landed, right in there. It knocked the top of the trees out and everything else. So I stood there for, well, oh, I say, 15 minutes looking at it. Meanwhile, 12 miles away in nearby Greensburg, the switchboard at radio station WHJB jumps to life. WHJB, could you hold on one second? WHJB. Office manager Mabel Massa answers the sudden flurry of phone calls. People were telling me something fell in Kecksburg, and uh, somebody said it was a ball of fire. Somebody said it was a plane wreck. There were just a number of stories that kept coming in. The phones just kept ringing. When Mabel fields a call from someone claiming to have seen a UFO outside Kecksburg, she hands the phone to John Murphy, the station's news director. Hey, John. Yeah. I said, here, you take this one. John Murphy, all right, what, what, what'd you see? And he came back and he said to me, he said, this is a big one, kid. I'm going to Kecksburg. Wait, wait, wait. Your camera. Thanks, kid. See you later. WHJB. Back at the crash site, Bill Bullybush is trying to decide whether to move closer to the smoldering object partially embedded in the ground. The color of it was like a burnt orange. It was burnt from the front clear to the back. And I could see this ring around the back of it. And it looked like Egyptian writing on the back of it. There was no windows in it, no seams, no rivet marking. It was just a solid piece. Bully Bush fears the smoking object may explode. So after 15 minutes, he retreats. On the way to his car, he hears curious residents already gathering outside the woods. Bully Bush climbs into his Corvair and returns home. Within an hour, the area has been cordoned off by a growing number of military personnel and local officials. They refuse to let onlookers get closer to the mysterious object. Though they have a limited view, the group can see a plume of blue smoke rising from the forest. 19-year-old Bill Weaver is out for a joyride in Kecksburg when he hears a radio bulletin describing a strange light in the sky. Intrigued, he heads to the south side of the woods, an area that has not been secured by the military. Weaver finds a handful of people there, peering into the wooded valley. We thought it was a Russian satellite at first. But at 19 years old, I was still curious. Actually, I went back in there, was out of curiosity to see if there was something that did land there. In the waning evening light, Weaver says that he and the others can barely make out the object below. It looked like it had plowed into the ground somewhat. Radiating off, I don't know if it was the front or the back or side, was a blue light, much like a welder's light. It gets real bright and then it gets dull. It would go back and forth. As Weaver and the others try to get a better look, he says officials move them further back, away from the woods. Around 6.30 p.m., Bill Bullybush returns to the scene, this time with his seven-year-old son, Ricky. 
I never seen so many people. And, and the army was there. I couldn't figure out how the army got there so quick. The army kept everybody away. About an hour later, WHJB newsman John Murphy arrives on the scene. He sneaks into the woods and secretly takes a few photographs of the strange object. No more pictures. Accounts differ, but those close to Murphy believe some key photographs are confiscated by officials. He begins recording statements from a number of people. What you are about to hear are excerpts of the actual interviews Murphy conducted. What did it look like? It looked like a star on fire. A star on fire? Can you point out what part of the wood you saw it in? Right down there. Down in there. Was there any smoke coming from it? Yeah. Murphy calls in a bulletin to his colleague Stan Wall, WHJB's evening disc jockey. John Murphy. I'm out in the woods here outside of Kecksburg. It's bright and there's smoke every place. Okay, John, I'll give you, uh, you're going to be on live in like 30 seconds, okay? John didn't like to go on the air if he wasn't certain with something. He, he didn't like to speculate. He gave us different opinions on what it could have been. As the evening went on, people really became anxious to find out what really happened. Then we had other radio stations and TV stations and so forth calling about this thing that had landed in Kecksburg. A growing military contingent continues to clear the area of onlookers as Murphy tries to collect more eyewitness accounts. About an hour and a half later at 9 p.m., Bob Gatti, a 22-year-old reporter, arrives at the scene from the Greensburg paper, the Tribune Review. Along the road were state police, and there were some military people there. And I believe they were army people, and they had guns. They were keeping people from going back into this field. Robert Blystone is less than a quarter mile from his parents' home. From there, he sees a flurry of activity. A large flatbed truck, accompanied by army jeeps, disappears into the wooded valley. Almost two hours later, the convoy emerges, but Blystone notices that the flatbed is no longer empty, and he sees what the military is trying to hide. And you can see on the flatbed a design under the uh, tarp, like a bell, shape or uh, acorn shape vehicle that was under there. Robert Blystone isn't the only one who sees this strange cargo. By the next day, several eyewitnesses tell John Murphy, Bob Gaddy, and others that they saw a strange object in the sky that they believe came to Earth. The front page of our local paper, the Greensburg Tribune Review, had Big headlines on Army Ropesloth area, unidentified flying object falls near Kecksburg. But another article in a later edition of the paper suggests that the eyewitnesses are mistaken. In that piece, state troopers say they have recovered, quote, absolutely nothing from the site. According to at least one researcher, this story and later statements make eyewitnesses suspect a government cover-up. The question still remains, what was this object? Uh, and we've been trying to track down and get answers to that for many, many years. The people want to know the truth. They want to know if we're alone out there. December 10th, 1965. One day after about a dozen people near Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, witness what they believe was a UFO crash. Many are surprised to read in their local paper that government officials have discovered no physical evidence. They made a thorough search in the woods and there was nothing there, and that officially the government was saying now that people have been mistaken, nothing had fallen to the woods. Stan Gordon is a local UFO researcher who has studied the Kecksburg case for nearly 40 years. He was 16 years old at the time of the incident. Gordon and others will challenge that conclusion for the next four decades. In 
In the days following the events of December 9th, local radio station WHJB's news director, John Murphy, gathers the eyewitness accounts he had recorded that night. The journalist is intrigued by the tapes which indicate that something fell into the woods outside Kecksburg. The following is an excerpt from Murphy's tapes. You want to describe the explosion? Well, I seen two big bright flashes and a long streak of orange light. I figured it was a plane. He decides to produce a documentary about that night. Murphy titles his project, Object in the Woods. John had me help him write up a story, and he wanted to make sure everything got in there included. And he was real excited. For several days, they work on the program. Murphy also listens to his interviews with local authorities. We checked in with the Pennsylvania State Police to find out how right an area this report had come in from. Oh, my. Uh, as far as Canada, in Ohio, it's been seen all over. Uh, these flashes have been coming all over the northeastern United States. But just a few days before Object in the Woods is set to air, two men identifying themselves to Mabel Mazza as government agents visit Murphy at the station. We wanted to let them talk privately, so we put them in the FM studio. So the men went in there with John and closed the door. Mabel says the meeting lasts about 30 minutes. For some reason, John Murphy was afraid. He just said, I can't talk about it. I cannot talk about it. And he said, just, just leave me alone. He sort of lost some of his spark. And I have no idea what it was, but it was after the visit of those two men. But the excitement in John was completely gone. And when I tried to question him on it, he didn't want to talk about it. Murphy moves ahead with plans to broadcast Object in the Woods. The show airs on WHJB in late December. But the documentary that listeners hear is not the one Murphy had intended. Object in the woods. I say to him, I say, John, that's not what you said the other night. Well, he said, I, I have to change it. You know, I said, well, why do you have to change it? But he would never tell me. When it was aired, it was absolutely not the same documentary as it was prepared. At the beginning of the broadcast, Murphy advises his audience that his report has been edited. We regret that part of the program had to be censored and other parts of the program had to be cut out entirely. Despite his meeting just days before with the men who tell Mabel Mazza they were with the government, Murphy asserts that there has been no official pressure to alter his production. This station has not been contacted by any official agency of the state, federal, or local government in connection with this program. Murphy instead explains that the program has been changed because some interviewees became nervous about having their statements broadcast. We received other calls early tonight from some other people who said they had changed their minds now at the last minute and did not want the statements they had made over this past weekend used on this radio program tonight. In the years that followed, Murphy never discusses his meeting with the two men or his decision to run the edited version of the documentary. I don't think John ever became his real self then again because uh, it's something that lingered with him. Years later, Murphy's ex-wife remembers the importance he placed on the Kecksburg event and the effect it had on him personally. And this is like the story of his lifetime. I mean, it's the way he treated it. And all of a sudden, nothing, not a word. It was totally unlike him to drop something like that. She also maintains that authorities confiscated some of the photos Murphy had taken in the woods that night. I know John had pictures of the object. He told me he did. He wouldn't lie about that. It's too good a story to pass up. 
Whatever secrets John Murphy held about that mysterious visit, he took to his grave. In February of 1969, Murphy was struck and killed by a car on a highway near Ventura, California. His dad gave me the police report to read. There was too many things in it that didn't make sense. For the next 20 years, the events of December 9th, 1965, seemed to fade from public memory, only occasionally becoming the subject of talk for Kecksburg area residents. Nevertheless, local researcher Stan Gordon is committed to collecting whatever information he can find. I would periodically get a relative of somebody who was there that night, somebody knew something else. Most people who have experiences don't want any publicity. They're afraid of being ridiculed, and for various reasons, they don't want to go public. In the mid-1980s, one of Gordon's colleagues unearths a Project Blue Book report concerning Kecksburg. The Air Force developed Project Blue Book to investigate all reported UFO sightings and determine if they were a national security threat. From 1947 until 1969, the study gathered more than 12,000 reports, 700 of which were classified unidentified. Though the report erroneously cites Acme, Pennsylvania as the location, Gordon knows that it refers to the crash in the Kecksburg Woods. While it's possible that the formerly classified file will finally shed new light on the events of that night, after nearly two decades of waiting, Stan Gordon is not surprised with the military's explanation. The Project Blue Book report basically states that a search was conducted until about 2 a.m., that only three Air Force personnel were involved in the search, and that nothing was found, and that officially people had seen just a bright meteor in the sky, that nothing had fallen to the ground that day. Gordon doubts the veracity of the Blue Book report. He's talked to eyewitnesses who describe a much larger military presence at the scene. So here you have military personnel coming in to other people's private property. They're preventing other civilians from going down to other people's property. They're stopping and turning them around. So what was so important down in those woods that the military didn't want those people to see? Gordon looks for eyewitnesses, but many are reluctant to come forward. Then, in September of 1988, Stan Gordon gets an indication of what the military may have been hiding. Through an anonymous tip, he finds truck driver Bill Bullybush, who is now 62 years old. And these symbols, how well could you Bullybush, who Gordon believes may be the first person to see the object, has kept his silence for 23 years. During that meeting, Gordon takes Bullybush out to the Kecksburg woods and has him retrace his steps from that night. He took us down from the top of Media Road down through the woods, went behind the tree, said, this is the tree I stood behind that night, pointed over to the spot. Bullybush's account matches that of another eyewitness Gordon has interviewed. Each man independently describes the solid, windowless object with strange writing along the sides. Bullybush also tells Gordon of the large amount of military personnel, mostly Army, he saw that night. That memory, Bullybush says, has stayed with him because of the impact it seemed to have on his young son, Ricky. You see an Army in a picture in the movies, you know, and that, but to, to see him out in real life at seven years old, it really, really fixed him up. Gordon believes the strongest evidence that something occurred comes from objective eyewitnesses. You have not only civilians who report as seeing military personnel, but you also have reporters as eyewitnesses as well who reported seeing military personnel on the scene that evening. Bob Gatti is one of them. They had rifles. I come from an Army family, and I know what an Army uniform looks like. And uh, I, I believe it was Army. I'm not sure how many altogether there were. It impressed me at the time that there were quite a few. I know it was Army, for one thing, because I could see the star on the truck that showed that that was Army. Mabel Mazza, WHJB's office manager, okay. 
remembers receiving phone calls at the station from people identifying themselves as military authorities that night. Within about an hour of the phones ringing, I had uh, military personnel call me on the phone and ask me the directions to Kecksburg. And they wanted to know what I knew. And I said, I don't know anything. I'm just taking the phone calls. Thank you. They just weren't coming from one direction. They seemed to have uh, just all come in at one time from all directions. In 1990, as the 25th anniversary of the Kecksburg event nears, the story garners national media attention. Several of the eyewitness reports that Stan Gordon has uncovered are featured. The press coverage helps reignite the debate about what really happened in Kecksburg. As I've looked at many of these stories that associate space events, satellites, re-entries, launchings, with UFO reports, I've been struck by how often they are connected By 1991, the strange occurrence outside Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, more than 25 years before, continues to be the subject of speculation. Could it have been a UFO? Based on what witnesses described, space consultant James Oberg believes he may have an alternate explanation for the Kecksburg object. They talked about an acorn-shaped object. And as a spe specialist in Soviet space history, I realized that wasn't a bad description of the reentry capsule on the Soviet Venus probe. In 1965, NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, tracked Cosmos 96. NORAD knew that the satellite's Venus probe re-entered the atmosphere the same day as the Kecksburg event. But the Soviets didn't acknowledge that the mission failed. Cosmos 96 was a Russian probe to Venus that got stuck in its parking orbit. The rocket failed. It never got any further. So it fell back to Earth and burned up. Cosmos 96 was part of the USSR's Venera project, a 22-year study of the planet Venus. NORAD lacked the technology to determine exactly where the craft landed a mystery that the agency says remains to this day. Oberg thinks the Kecksburg object could be Cosmos 96. To test his theory, he seeks out the Air Force tracking data from December 9, 1965. The Air Force keeps very detailed historical records of satellites in space. Oberg believes they may be the key to solving the Kecksburg mystery. But when Oberg examines the data, he finds a key inconsistency between the Cosmos probe and what happened in Kecksburg. At the time of the Kecksburg sightings, the flight path of Cosmos 96 was nowhere near Pennsylvania. People around Kecksburg reported seeing the fireball in the early evening around 4.45 p.m., as much as 13 hours after the Cosmos 96 re-entry. While the probe was believed to have entered the atmosphere over central Canada, NORAD now thinks it could have been as far away as the Indian Ocean. Oberg maintains it is possible that the Air Force intentionally released misleading data on Cosmos 96. Perhaps if it was the satellite and it did come down, the Air Force released false tracking data to camouflage this fact. Oberg asserts that in the tense Cold War atmosphere, U.S. officials would have had every reason to keep such a find under wraps. But by the year 2000, when he has access to more accurate data, Oberg finally dismisses the Cosmos 96 theory. The coincidence of the satellite coming back to Earth the same day that this object was found in Pennsylvania, it was very tempting. Later on, better tracking data allowed us to see that this was not, in fact, a connection. It was a pure coincidence. Still, he maintains that other satellites can't be entirely ruled out. 
There are candidates from spacecraft, Russian and our spacecraft. The 60s was a period of very intense aerospace activity. Lots of stuff in the air, lots of it falling out of the air, and a lot of that really, really secret. Stuff that took years to come out, if it ever did come out. It is possible, Oberg asserts, that a piece of a craft, often referred to as orbital debris, or space junk, survived entry into the Earth's atmosphere and landed near Kecksburg. People don't realize how much of the space junk that fell back to Earth survived. We have struts and, and beams and, and insulation fragments that have re-entered the atmosphere. Most satellite burns up. These pieces survive, hit the ground. And those pieces that did hit the ground were, would be of immense interest to military intelligence officers. Still, Oberg considers that an unlikely scenario. For Stan Gordon, the space junk theory still fails to fully explain what eyewitnesses reported and what he's come to believe. I'm convinced beyond any doubt that an object of unknown origin did fall from the sky, and apparently the military came and recovered it. We've heard everything. One witness told me years ago that a Gemini capsule had been expelled in the area that night, even though no information on that has ever been found. One witness indicated that he had information that the object was a projectile fired from a giant gun from a railroad car in Canada. We have something unidentified. And the more we eliminate the possible options for it, the more mysterious it becomes, and the more intriguing the question becomes as to what it actually was. Leslie Kane is a journalist working with the Coalition for Freedom of Information, a group funded by the Sci-Fi Channel that has taken on the Kecksburg case. We have scientists down there that have actually been able to prove that there was something in those woods that came down. Still, in 1992, an amateur astronomer unearths long forgotten evidence, which he believes settles the matter once and for all. We have evidence. Now, I think Kecksburg is a closed case. In September of 1990, a nationally broadcast television program features a segment on the Kecksburg story. Robert Young, an amateur astronomer and lecturer at a Pennsylvania planetarium, becomes intrigued by the case. He delves into newspaper articles and re-examines eyewitness reports. He later publishes an article declaring that there's nothing unsolved about the Kecksburg case. The elements of this story that might suggest that there's something unusual happen, the armed troops, an armed convoy, the object itself, these stories only come from a very tiny handful of people. Young suspects that those early reports from the night of December 9th may have simply been blown out of proportion. Hoping to learn more, he tracks down Ed Myers, who was Kecksburg's fire chief in 1965. Ed Myers told me that uh, while there was a search and a lot of people were there, that nothing was recovered and there weren't large numbers of military people. Young collects 150 eyewitness accounts from newspapers and his own interviews. They indicate that the official explanation is the closest to the truth, that nothing fell to earth and there was no major military presence in Kecksburg that night. Myers also accounts for the blue lights seen in the woods. There were some high school kids who were running through the woods flashing a camera strobe, which created blue flashing lights. Then, in early 1992, Young discovers an academic paper published in the August 1967 Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Von Del Chamberlain is one of the two authors who suggests that the light seen over Kecksburg was a fireball meteor, a celestial occurrence notable for its intense brightness and visibility over a large distance. 
It was seen over several states. It was very well observed throughout lower Michigan and especially southwest Ontario over by Windsor. Chamberlain and his colleague were able to map out the trajectory of the fireball by using these two photos of the object's dust trail taken by photographers in Michigan. We were able to use these because the photos were taken from two different places. They had landscape features so that with the photographers, we could go back to the place where the camera was. Eyewitnesses Bill Bullybush and Robert Blystone have maintained that the object seemed to make a controlled landing into the Kecksburg woods. Vondell Chamberlain says these accounts are likely an illusion that's easily explained. Typically, when a bright fireball occurs, people who are out on the periphery of its observation will believe they know where it came down because the fireball is still glowing, still bright in the sky when it goes to or even beyond the visible horizon. So it will look like it came down beyond the nearby buildings or trees. Chamberlain says if a meteor makes contact with the Earth's surface at all, it can be several hundred miles away from where eyewitnesses believe it came down. Chamberlain and Young conclude that the Kecksburg event was most likely a typical fireball meteor. But what of the descriptions of the object making a series of S-turns over Kecksburg? Well, the, the trail is left by dust particles uh, in the atmosphere by the, the meteor that's coming in. The winds move the trail around as if you're looking at the contrail of an airplane uh, a few minutes later. And this contrail was visible for 20 minutes. Some people reported a half hour that they could see it in the western sky. So uh, lots of chance for the thing to assume other shapes. Leslie Kane, however, maintains that this argument ignores what some witnesses say was a significant military response. And the military wouldn't behave like that if a meteorite had come down. I mean, it would have been known fairly quickly, and they could have let the media know that this is what it was. And Stan Gordon, a UFO researcher who has spent nearly 30 years investigating the Kecksburg case, says the eyewitness reports provide compelling evidence. I've interviewed hundreds of people who have direct or indirect knowledge about the case. And it's not been easy to find some of these witnesses because the majority of them didn't want any publicity. And what's so intriguing is the fact that so many of their statements and information they have verify other people's accounts. In 1992, Robert Young challenges Gordon to re-examine the facts. I sent Stan Gordon a copy of the Chamberlain Krauss paper and it had the photographs. And I asked him for his comment, how does this affect this particular story? Never heard from him again. But Gordon claims that Robert Young refuses to accept the eyewitness accounts of credible people. Investigative journalist Leslie Kane has pursued the case since 2002 and believes it's not a meteor. There's too much information that doesn't add up. In 2003, production began on a television program about the Kecksburg UFO. The Sci-Fi Channel funded CFI, or the Coalition for Freedom of Information, to research the Kecksburg incident. It's time that CFI presses for the release of related government documents. They have every right to this information. Leslie Kane is the group's co-founder. She describes her mission as that of an objective investigator, not a UFO hunter. I'm trying to stay right on track as a journalist that all it means is that we don't know what the object is. Kane doubts the official explanation that the object residents saw over Kecksburg was a meteor. I'm sure there are many, there are scientists and others that believe that that's the most likely explanation for this event in 1965. The problem is that there are so many eyewitness accounts 
that describe a physical object coming down. She believes that the reports of eyewitnesses are key. Among them is Bill Weaver, who remembers a heavy military presence in and around the woods that night. You know, these people that are saying that nothing happened that night, that they never seen any uh, military there. Either one, they weren't there, or two, they aren't telling the truth. Because this did happen. In an effort to determine scientifically if an object came down in the woods outside Kecksburg, the TV program includes a study by Dr. Ray Hicks of West Virginia University. A professor of forestry, Dr. Hicks examines the rings on a core sample of damaged trees there. He studied those trees and went inside them and he was able to document that this was actually caused by f something physical and he was able to date the damage back to the year 1965. This is very, very significant proof, or close to proof, smoking gun, as it were, that there was a physical object that came down. And yes, indeed, that object is an unidentified flying object. The result of Dr. Hicks' testing appears to support the eyewitness account of Bill Bullybush. You can see where it laid the trees over on the tops, knocks the top right out. They were all bent the way it came in. Kane and CFI also re-examined the Cosmos 96 claim. She retained the assistance of Nicholas Johnson, NASA's chief scientist for orbital debris. Johnson reconfirms that Cosmos 96, a failed Russian space mission, was not what fell in Kecksburg. In an email to the History Channel, Johnson says he searched the US satellite catalog. It revealed that Cosmos 96 was the only cataloged object to re-enter on December 9th, 1965. It was not a missile, it was not an aircraft. I thought that was a very, very powerful statement because he said everything is cataloged even if it's a somewhat sensitive military experiment. Robert Young dismisses the significance that Kane and others place on eyewitness accounts and points to the photos as the strongest pieces of evidence that the Kecksburg object was a meteor. They don't have anything except some stories against uh, physical evidence, the pictures. Over the years, the media attention has taken its toll on this rural community. Some say a definite rift remains between those in Kecksburg who believe something fell from the sky and those who don't. You got relatives who one was involved, the other one says, this is bull, nothing happened that night, who don't talk to each other, some still don't talk today. Bill Weaver remembers feeling pressured not to talk about his experiences that night. It was just something that's secret. You'd be damn near a communist, you know, to, to uh, talk about something like this. CFI continues to press for documents from agencies that might shed light on whatever happened in Kecksburg on December 9th, 1965. We are proceeding with both Air Force and Army investigations, and we have every intention of, of filing lawsuits against those agencies at a certain point if we do not receive satisfactory response from them. Kane cites the example of Project Blue Book as evidence demonstrating that the military is unwilling to reveal the truth. Uh, at one point, there's an interesting section in there in which they uh, say that uh, the media has been calling and the head of Project Blue Book says, you can tell them it's a meteor, but the, the document goes on to say, but we're still investigating the case. With Leslie Kane, CFI is a participant in a suit pending with NASA in hopes of forcing the space agency to release any documents it may have on the Kecksburg case. A previous request for documents in 2003 yielded 36 pages of what CFI calls irrelevant material. These are American citizens who deserve this information, who have every right to this information. Many of those who were in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania on the night of December 9th, 1965, agree. I'd really like to know what did come down. As I can tell you, it was no meteor, that's for sure. 
because it was being controlled. Anybody that saw it could tell you that. I don't believe the government will ever tell us the truth and until generations down the road. My grandchildren may know. The trouble is, we're all suspicious. And if their evidence is that nothing occurred, how do they prove to us that nothing occurred? Will we believe them? I wonder about that. The preceding program presented theories about an historical event that is shrouded in mystery. It contained archival footage, reenactments, and dramatizations, which invite you, the viewer, to draw your own conclusions. The following program presents theories about an historical event that is shrouded in mystery. It contains archival footage, reenactments, and dramatizations, which invite you, the viewer, to draw your own conclusions. To the uninformed, this stark terrain, 100 miles north of Las Vegas, may look like any other patch of desert. But its rugged valleys conceal a military facility so secret, it is off limits to all but those with the highest security clearance. Known as Area 51, this is one of the most mysterious places on the face of the Earth. What they have out in the desert would make George Lucas envious. We have things out there that are literally out of this world. For decades, there has been a coordinated strategy among several federal agencies to deceive people about what the military is doing here. Until recently, the government even denied the existence of a base at Area 51. Not only did the people not know, the people's representatives didn't know, and the chance for abuses were very great. In the face of the government silence, Area 51 has become fertile ground for fantastical lore, legend, and rumor. The hasty cover-ups, the shrouded trucks, the secret flights of cargo planes. This was exactly what you would do if a UFO had crashed and you wanted to keep that secret. First-hand accounts of the activities around and within the perimeter are scarce. Those few who have been inside are sworn to secrecy. We flew all over the United States. Nobody knew we were there. We didn't tell anybody. But in 1989, one man came forward with an amazing claim, that he had worked inside Area 51, retro-engineering an alien spacecraft. It had an absolute classic flying saucer in there, so, like something out of a cartoon or a science fiction movie. Are flying saucers being tested in the Nevada desert? Or is the government's veil of secrecy hiding something else? In southern Nevada, there is a 575 square mile expanse of heavily guarded land and restricted airspace that pilots call Dreamland. But most people refer to it as Area 51, the designation it received from the Atomic Energy Commission in 1958. 42-year-old German-born Jörg Arnu maintains a website dedicated to exploring this mysterious region and makes regular scouting trips to its closely guarded perimeter. This is the famous uh, border of Area 51 right here. We see the warning signs on both sides of the road here. Up on the hill behind me, there's a security vehicle with two security guards with binoculars and probably all kinds of other equipment watching us right now. Since the late 1950s, numerous unidentified flying objects have been spotted in the skies above Area 51. See, see that's, that's a ship. The locals are used to hearing reports about such unexplained phenomena. 
we saw a craft in the sky and we stopped our vehicle and watched it do maneuvers. It was doing zigzags, right, lefts, up. Oh, it was, it was pretty crazy. Whatever is happening within Area 51, the government is committed to keeping it secret. They're authorized to shoot you. If they did, there isn't a law enforcement agency in the world that could go retrieve your body if you were in Area 51. You have no access to get in there. The propulsion system is really an amazing But in 1989, a 30-year-old resident of Las Vegas named Bob Lazar claims to have pierced the veil of secrecy surrounding these flights. If they were United States craft, we wouldn't be going backward trying to find out how they were built if we had built them. Uh, second of all... His story uh, leads thousands of people to believe that something otherworldly is happening in the Nevada desert. When Bob Lazar emerged in public with his claims to have worked on reverse-engineered flying saucers, it began to draw UFO fans from around the world. Oh, yeah. It's floating. Yeah, it does. It looks like it's floating, but it was changing shape. And his legend became critical to the whole emerging folklore of Area 51. To this day, Lazar stands by his story. I'm convinced this was an extraterrestrial craft. I verified how the equipment in it worked, and it was a technology that doesn't exist even today. Spring 1989, Bob Lazar meets with George Knapp, a reporter for Las Vegas TV station KLAS. Lazar claims to have secrets he can no longer hold. This was really taking a toll on me. I mean, I was exhausted. He tells Knapp that he was hired by the federal government to work on an alien spacecraft at Area 51. Great. It probably would have gone to about 60. And he insists that the authorities will do anything to stop him from revealing what he knows. There was a guy in the car with a gun. He shot at me and went off, and I just thought it was some government guy trying to wipe me out. Lazar tells the reporter he wants to protect himself from reprisals by going public with his amazing story. Nevertheless, he appears in silhouette to conceal his identity. So what you're saying is that we can produce... The first interview was really just to state what had happened, what was going on, and in case I suddenly disappeared, all it would do was prove that what I was saying was true. Very short amount of time, and I guarantee you, gentlemen, that... Lazar's story begins in 1988, when, he says, his background in physics and electronics lands him a job interview with top government contractor Edgerton, Germershausen & Greer, or EG&G. I was told there was an opening available from, uh, for a new exotic field propulsion system that I would be working in a remote area. It all sounded great to me. It's exactly what I wanted to get into. In December 1988, he is hired. On his first day of work, Lazar claims to have met a man named Dennis Mariani at the EG&G Special Projects Office at McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas. Dennis Mariani is kind of a military-looking guy. It always looks you in the eye and very hard-looking. I don't think the guy ever smiled. Mariani escorts Lazar aboard a private plane that flies them 100 miles north to an isolated military base in the Nevada desert, Area 51. Immediately after landing, Mariani subjects Lazar to a rigorous security briefing and has him sign a secrecy agreement. You basically signed away a lot of your rights. I believe it was called the 1010 agreement. It was a $10,000 fine, 10 year prison sentence, you know, for divulging any of the information presented to you. According to Lazar, he agrees to conditions he will later regret. He even gives up his right to a trial if he ever reveals anything about working at Area 51. After Lazar signs the document, he and Mariani board a bus with blacked out windows. The bus leaves Area 51 
and drives, I'm guessing, 10 to 15 miles south on a dirt road. It was kind of exciting, because I thought, boy, if it's, we're leaving Area 51 in a bus with windows that I can't look out of, this must be really secret, and so I was fascinated. The bus finally stops at an installation called S4. Mariani explains that the site is a series of hidden hangars built into the landscape. It's extremely well camouflaged. Years later, Lazar will have a graphic artist create detailed renderings based on his own drawings of what he claims he saw at S4. There are hangar doors that are sand textured and standing back maybe three or 400 feet, you really can't see them at all. It pretty much just looks like a continuation of the mountain. Mariani leads Lazar inside the tightly guarded facility. It was very much an oppressive military atmosphere. There was always somebody there on top of you, keeping an eye on you. They were virtually robots. They had no emotions. Not to imply that they were robots, but, you know, they acted like robots. Lazar says he has issued a security badge that authorizes his clearance through the, quote, U.S. Department of Naval Intelligence. Mariani then leads him to a secure briefing room. On the desk is a stack of blue folders. Is everything you'll need to know to begin working on it? Until I come. Lazar is allowed to review these files alone. Looking through some of the information, it gave direct references to a flying saucer, to an, an extraterrestrial vehicle. I pretty much discounted that and just kept going on. And I, I thought, well, boy, this must be part of some security measure. It could be a part of all some big psychological test of some sort. So I glanced through everything and um, digested what I could. When Mariani takes him back to the hangar, Lazar claims he is confronted with an incredible sight. We walked into a hangar, which was extremely large, and they had an absolute classic flying saucer in there, so like something out of a cartoon or a science fiction movie. It was sitting on its, on its belly on the ground, and I went up and raised my hand to touch the metal on the craft and immediately got disciplined for that. Lazar assumes that the vehicle is an experimental aircraft designed to resemble something from outer space. Yeah, you know, well, it's got a flying saucer shape. This explains why so many people see flying saucers, because we're trying to make an aircraft that, that way. So still nothing really hit my mind as far as being alien or any, anything along those lines. But Lazar says he revises that assumption when his job duties are explained to him. The basic aim of what we're doing here is to see if we can duplicate any of this material with substances found on Earth. Or, well, what do you mean with substances found on Earth? And then it began to validate some of what I had read, that this was in fact an alien craft. As he examines the saucer, Lazar becomes convinced that it is in fact of extraterrestrial origin. It was obviously made for something smaller. Ideally, about half the height of a human would have no problem walking around in there. Everything is a rounded, curved radius to it. It looks like the entire thing was an injection mold, like uh, made out of plastic or wax. He says he is then told that the vehicle's propulsion system allows the pilot to traverse great distances instantaneously by manipulating time and space. If you have a machine that can create gravity, that makes force fields a reality, that makes time travel possible, all the stuff you read about in science fiction becomes possible if you can manipulate gravity. Lazar is overwhelmed by the possibilities. Until now, he had considered the whole idea of flying saucers to be a fantasy. It actually left me pretty much confused and led to a lot of sleepless nights for a long time. Everything you didn't believe is true.
December 1988. According to Bob Lazar, he is employed at a top secret military installation in the Nevada desert called Area 51. The Las Vegas resident is here, he asserts, to study an alien spaceship. Lazar claims there are at least nine such craft concealed within Area 51. They were all on hangars, and some were not completely assembled. But the sport model, the sleek one, the one that I was allowed in at that one time, was the only one I ever had physical contact with. Lazar's main responsibility is to determine what had powered the vehicle. This was such an advanced machine that we were looking at, from the fuel to the way it was handled, to the energy to put, it puts out, there was, it, it was completely alien in, in every way. He nicknames one ship the sport model and claims it makes several low altitude test flights in early 1989. Lazar says his supervisor, Dennis Mariani, invites him to observe one of them. The craft lifted off the ground silently with a slight glow on the bottom which I assumed was a corona discharge, kind of like a St. Elmo's fire from high voltage. Made just a little hissing sound, lifted off the ground and moved over to the left and to the right and sat down. And to me, that was uh, absolutely impressive. Throughout his time at Area 51, Lazar claims, his employers keep him working irregular hours. I only went out when I was called out there. Uh, I could get a call at 9 o'clock at night Actually, I got a call once at 11.30 at night, and they stated, we would like you down at McCarran Airport by 12.15. How do you tell your wife? You know, you're in bed, you get a call. OK, I got to go. Well, what, <laughs> what is it? Oh, it's my job. I don't know if I'm going to be coming back until tomorrow. And then by this point, Lazar says, he had worked at Area 51 for four months and felt he could no longer abide by his confidentiality agreement. At sundown on Wednesday, March 22, 1989, Lazar, his wife, and three friends drive to the edge of Area 51 to watch the test flight of a saucer. The craft was typically only tested on a Wednesday night because it was the middle of the week, because there was very little travel on the adjacent highways to the test site. Around 8 p.m., the group notices a bright light rising behind a mountain pass in the distance. It came towards us very fast and made abrupt 90 degree turns. Yeah, we're fine. And the higher energy level the craft is at, the more it glows. Oh my God. Lazar's friends are awestruck by the object's erratic maneuvers. Nothing can, can make a, a 90 degree turn moving at hundreds of miles an hour. And that's what left an impression in everyone's mind. According to Lazar, the alien ship hovers for a few more moments before it disappears behind the mountains. The following Wednesday night, Lazar and his group return to the same spot in the desert. Since we got away with it the first time, we wanted to go back and now actually get pictures of the craft. But, you know, it's like filming a star at night. It's just a blob of light moving around. One week later, they make a third nighttime foray to Area 51. This time, however, they've pushed their luck too far. The security guys had found us, and it's pitch black out there, and they turn the lights on, and there's just, just an army of people out there. It, it, it was quite incredible. The armed guards check their IDs, and take their names before releasing them. As they leave, Lazar and his friends are pulled over by a Lincoln County Sheriff's deputy who holds them for questioning. The next day, Lazar asserts, Dennis Mariani and Area 51 security agents threaten him. 
one of the first things they said was, you know, when we trusted you with this information, we didn't mean, you know, intend for you to tell everyone you know about it. <laughs> they Gardell's an M16 directly in my face and, uh, you know, wanted to impress upon me how serious they were about it. According to Lazar, he is released and his employment at Area 51 ends. From then on, he says, he becomes the victim of a relentless campaign of intimidation. I was driving down Charleston Boulevard in Las Vegas, and as I came to the freeway on-ramp, there was a car that kept trying to get alongside of me. I heard a gunshot, and it caught my attention, and there was a guy in the car with a gun. I went straight, went off the end, and stopped in the dirt. I was really just paralyzed in the car. I was holding the steering wheel, and I thought he was coming up alongside of me, and there was just nothing I can do. It is at this point that Lazar decides to take his story to the public in an interview with KLAS-TV reporter George Knapp. In May of 1989, he appears in silhouette on the 5 o'clock local news. I did go on the air and basically say some of the stuff that I had seen. Right after the interview, I get a call from Dennis Mariani at home, and he said, do you have any idea what we're going to do to you now? And I said, no, what? And he hung up the phone. Yes. Six months later, Lazar agrees to another interview with KLAS-TV. This time, he reveals his identity on the air. Afterwards, he appears on numerous other television and radio shows and even creates a video about his experiences. I had at least partial views of the nine different discs out at S4. I went into much greater detail. Years ago, I thought I'd never hear myself say this, but that vehicle... Explained what was going on, who I worked with, where the things were. You know, just pretty much got it all on the record. They led me to believe it was uh, a field The TV reports system. that he did brought a lot of attention to the area and to him. In secret that we were working They were picked up nationally by other media, uh, and they helped establish the whole mythology of Area 51 in the national consciousness. Soon, people from across the country flocked to the Nevada desert, hoping to glimpse the mysterious lights of an alien spacecraft. I watched a craft with my niece one night for 20 minutes do really, really strange maneuvers. I know there's strange activity that goes on out here. It was actually the second time when I saw the craft, when I got to enter it. In November 1989, Bob Lazar makes an astonishing claim on a Las Vegas television news program. He says that he worked on alien spacecraft at a super secret military base called Area 51. Lazar is not the first to describe extraordinary events at a facility the government denies even exists. Rumors about UFO sightings in the Nevada desert had been heard for decades. But Lazar is the first to maintain that he had actually worked on alien technology. He seems to have little reason to lie. I don't know anything about aliens or abductions or crop circles or any of that. But I do know this craft came from somewhere else. Lazar looked like he could have been what he said, which was a sort of nerdy engineer who worked for government high-tech research programs. The uh, materials that were in use, completely alien to us, pardon the And he and, uh, seemed to be radiating this sense of conviction. Some Almost all UFO and, uh, stories can usually tell in about five seconds that the person is nuts. Where you get the power what was uh, interesting in Lazar, really it was a compellingly well-told story. In the world of UFO fans, Lazar becomes an overnight sensation. Bob's coming out, so to speak. Just lit a fire under every UFO nut and enthusiast in the world. I mean, there were busloads of people coming in there. At the edge of Area 51, the town of Rachel, Nevada, 
becomes the jumping off spot for the curious. Rachel is an obscure little community in the middle of absolute nowhere. Really became the center of the universe for people interested in Area 51 and in UFOs. Everybody in the country and the world right now knows about what's going on out here. Oh, yeah. UFO buffs are not the only ones who make pilgrimages to watch the desert skies. Aviation enthusiasts, including a group of amateur plane spotters called the Interceptors, are also intrigued by Lazar's story. Jim Goodall is a senior member of the Interceptors, and since 1987, a regular sky watcher at Area 51. My obsession has been classified aircraft programs. It's that first glimpse of something you've never seen, or the public has never seen. That's what's exciting about going out here in the desert. And you want to be the first person to, you know, to get a high quality image. While some attribute the mysterious lights in the sky to extraterrestrial visitors. A bright object is being spotted right there. Some... The interceptors maintain that Area 51 is really a top secret testing facility for US military aircraft. They point to hard facts and photographic evidence to make their case. This particular disc appeared to be in excellent condition. And because Even so, of some of them, including Goodall, find Bob Lazar's story credible. I'm a technology person. I'm a hardware person. I'm not a UFO nut. I believe Bob Lazar because Bob Lazar you know, told a believable story and has never altered it. Goodall is persuaded in part by what appears to be solid evidence that Lazar did work for the military, a yearly earning statement from 1988 to 1989. According to Lazar, his W-2 tax form was issued by the, quote, Department of Naval Intelligence. There is, however, no such known Department of Government. In 1990, during Operation Desert Shield, Goodall is on active duty in Washington, D.C. with the Minnesota Air National Guard. He decides to check on the validity of Lazar's W-2 form and goes to the Navy's investigative office in the Pentagon. I went in to the Department of Naval Investigation in the Pentagon. And I said, I'd like a verification of where this location is. It's a classified zip code. And the Navy officer said, just a minute, and made a phone call. He said, you know, the Admiral would like to see you. Close the door, Sergeant. So I go into this Admiral's office, and he said, Sergeant, if you ever come in this office again with something like this, I'll have you court-martialed. Now get out of my office and get out of there now. If his W-2 was phony, why did this admiral have a hissy fit over it? Lazar's supporters claim that the so-called Department of Naval Intelligence, in keeping with the secrecy of Area 51, is a covert organization. As such, its existence has been kept from the general public and even the US Congress. But despite the support of people like Jim Goodall, critics believe that Bob Lazar is perpetrating a hoax. In particular, they cite the absence of any evidence to corroborate his story. He talks about what kind of UFOs he saw inside and so forth. You, you know, how can you react to that? I just try to think about, for what he tells us that, that we can verify, and I just haven't found anything. Skeptics scrutinize other claims made by Lazar. He worked there for less than 40 hours, and this is according to his own statements. In this one work week, he found the fuel that propels these aircraft or these uh, flying saucers. Now, that's a pretty amazing a discovery for your first work week. Stanton Friedman, a physicist educated at the University of Chicago, checks into Lazar's educational background. He supposedly had a master's in physics from MIT and another one in electronics from Caltech. OK, I check MIT, they never heard of him. I checked Caltech, they never heard of him. I checked his high school. Turned out he graduated in the bottom third of his high school class. Moreover, government contractor EG&G, with whom Lazar claims to have interviewed for the Area 51 job, says it has no record of Bob Lazar at all. So 
right away you have a problem with a guy who has a, a background that doesn't match up to uh, what he claims and can't demonstrate that he worked where he says he worked. So while you may not reject his claims out of hand, you've got to look at them with more suspicion. The electrical energy is transmitted essentially without wires. and I really He's a clever guy. He sounds very good. He comes across very well. People want to believe him. He's a con man. Yes, I was. Uh, While some dismiss Bob Lazar as a fraud, others believe there is a more sinister motive to his behavior, that he is an agent of the government tasked with perpetuating disinformation about Area 51. One had to question whether Lazar was sure who he was. Perhaps he was serving as a disinformation agent unwillingly. There were those who believed that he had been in some way brainwashed or even drugged. But for Lazar's supporters, the US government's silence speaks volumes. If he hadn't been involved with these people, they could say hey, he's a phony. That it ended Bob Lazar's career as a spokesperson for UFOs and reverse engineering and propulsion systems. No one ever did that. Some conspiracy buffs believe that the U.S. government actually encouraged Lazar's story and the myth of UFO sightings. It's an attempt, they say, to distract the public from what was really happening inside Area 51. There seemed to be a good strength to the theory that they were generating a lot of noise to disguise the real signal, which was experiments with advanced aircraft and that Lazar was the most intense piece of noise they were delivering. generally referred to as a flying saucer. In the early 1990s, after Bob Lazar goes public with his sensational claim that there are alien spacecraft inside Area 51, the isolated high security base becomes a magnet for tourists. There were bus tours going out there, so it, um, that pretty much did it. That put it on the map. Security is intensified to keep the curious out. But some say that the government actually uses Lazar's story to its advantage. In that case, if somebody actually saw a test flight and saw something they weren't supposed to see and they talk about it, they are just dealt with by the public as another UFO nut who has seen a UFO flying. Even though eyewitness reports and photographs of Area 51 are widely circulated on the internet, government officials continue to deny that the base even exists. It'd be like going out and having a Goodyear blimp out in the parking lot and, and someone tell you, there's no blimp out there. You know darn well there's one, until someone official says, yes, this is Area 51, it doesn't exist. And that's our government. In 1995, the installation's borders are greatly expanded, effectively prohibiting outsiders from even seeing the base. Any sign that, that says that we will shoot you if you trespass into here, well, why is that? What's the reason for it? I'm an American taxpayer. That's my stuff they're flying out there. I help pay for it. It's we the people. It's not us the government. That's been my philosophy from the very beginning. If they're flying out over public land, I have every right to photograph and see it. You can't blame the government for wanting to conceal what's going on there, but you can't blame the public for wondering what's going on there. There are some who say they know exactly what's been happening at Area 51. Men who worked there and can prove it. They saw much that the government didn't want the public to know about, but none of it, they say, was from outer space. Supposedly, uh, you know, extraterrestrial something's happened over there. I know nothing about that, I just read about it. Certainly didn't have any of that there when I was there. I was all over that base. Frank Murray flew the top secret A-12 spy plane 
at Area 51. He says the base played a vital role in U.S. military research and development during the Cold War. The base really got started in about 54 when Lockheed needed a place to test and develop the U-2 airplane, the first spy plane. In the early 1960s, the A-12 was developed to replace the U-2. The CIA commissioned this supersonic reconnaissance jet, capable of reaching speeds in excess of Mach 3 and cruising at altitudes over 90,000 feet. Frank Murray and others tested the A-12 at Area 51. We flew all over the United States with the airplane. Nobody knew we were there. We didn't tell anybody. There was no need to. Murray and former radar operator T.D. Barnes can talk about their experiences now because the top secret projects were declassified in the 1990s. Barnes does acknowledge that he had limited access to the base. There was something going on that we did not have a need to know. They'd hurt everybody on the base into the mess hall and pulled the blackout curtains. They'd have guards on them and, and we'd stay in there two or three hours or whatever the time period was required for whatever they were doing outdoors to wrap up. For the men assigned to Area 51, the intense secrecy permeated every aspect of their professional lives and even extended to their own families. Tell them nothing. Tell them just on a classified project, they can't talk about it. And they never did know until the whole thing was over. Both Murray and Barnes say they saw no alien spacecraft during their time at Area 51. But they did observe their colleagues serving their country in a program so secret, most Americans never knew of their heroism. We lost a lot of pilots. And I do not recall ever hearing a test pilot panic. As they hit the ground, they were still giving us scientific data. They're so trained. After Barnes and Murray left, other servicemen tested newer technology, like the F-117 stealth bomber in the late 1970s. Some say this plane could have been the real source of many UFO sightings at Area 51. The first time you see an F-117 head on, it looks like a flying saucer. If F-117 flight tests sparked rumors of alien spacecraft over the Nevada desert, that may have been just fine with military authorities. Why give it away by saying, oh, there's another military test going on in the high altitude aircraft? Much better oh, yeah. to dismiss it all as just being so much UFO nonsense. What military scientists have been developing at Area 51 in the years since the F-117 is anyone's guess. In the tense post-9-11 era, Area 51 is as impenetrable as ever. But it is evident that the base is still very active. Gotta be. The runway is now 25,000 feet long, and it's two or three times bigger than when I was there. For all I know, they're building systems to prevent an invasion of alien beings. You don't know. The technology doesn't sit still. So what are they up to? Jim Goodall says he once posed that very question to Ben Rich, a now deceased former vice president of the Lockheed Corporation. And he said, Jim, we have things out in the desert that are 50 years beyond what you can comprehend. If you've seen it on Star Trek or Star Wars or whatever science fiction movie you've seen, we've been there, done that. I said, can you expand upon that? He said, nope. Despite efforts to keep a tight lid on the activities at Area 51, officials are forced to publicly acknowledge the existence of the base for the first time when a lawsuit is filed in 1994 against the government. Allegations that hazardous chemicals had been improperly burned at the site leads critics to charge that the veil of secrecy is endangering the public safety. The whole existence of a toxic waste dump in, in Area 51 is a perfect metaphor for the 
toxicity of excessive secrecy and the dangers of secrecy. And secrecy, like any powerful chemical, is very useful stuff and it's also very dangerous stuff. Until 1994, the U.S. government refused to acknowledge the existence of its super-secret base known as Area 51. But in August of that year, a lawsuit brought by former employees of the secret air base forces the Department of Defense to change this policy. The suit claims that workers had been ordered to burn toxic byproducts of the stealth fighter program in open pits at the base causing them serious illnesses, and in some cases, death. When they went to court, the government used every measure at its disposal to shut down the whole story. Government attorneys argue that publicly revealing any information about the case would threaten national security. But critics believe the security measures had gone too far. Here's a situation that has nothing directly to do, you'd say, with um, secrecy, with black project aircraft, and so forth. Not only has the government not taken responsibility, they basically just quashed the case and will not release any information about what's going on there. Within a year, the government effectively stalls the suit. But the case does pressure the Pentagon to state that it, in fact, has an operating facility near Groom Lake finally acknowledging the existence of Area 51. It just forced their hand. There was a point at which they, yes, we acknowledge that there is a facility here, and they wouldn't say any more than that, but they at least that was a change from not even acknowledging it was there. Those pressing to learn the truth about Area 51 begin to ask more questions. Among them, how did the government manage to pay for a non-existent base for nearly four decades? The answer? the so-called black budget. The black budget is what's used to fund things like Area 51 or Dreamland because you don't want to reveal the specific details of what is being done. If you spent a billion or a couple billion dollars on a program and it failed, if it was a white program, you'd have you know, people jumping all over you. If it's a black program, no one knows. People saw Area 51 as a symbol of the abuses of some of our military decision making. And there was a lot of concern that, again, secrecy had become excessive, that uh, not only did the people not know, the people's representatives didn't know. And the chance for abuses were very great. Activists like Yur Garnu regard themselves as public watchdogs, determined to limit the potential for such abuse. What we're trying to accomplish is, is keeping the powers somewhat honest in not abusing this secrecy. Arnu claims that his quest to keep the government honest has led to a series of confrontations. In February of 2003, Arnu reported on his website that the government was using illegal tracking sensors on public land around the military base. Four months later, Arnu claims he received a threatening phone call from the FBI. And they made it very clear that it was very serious, that bad things would happen to me if I wouldn't stop. But, he says, he refuses to give up monitoring the activities at Area 51. Bob Lazar stands by his tantalizing story that the government is hiding alien spacecraft at Area 51. We can't prove things one way or the other. He can't prove what he says he saw. I can't prove he didn't see it. Lazar asserts that the government has gone to great lengths to quash his story and discredit him, including erasing his name from all of his past employment and academic records. 
there was a concerted effort to eliminate me paperwork-wise, eliminate my background and, and everything else I did. And it just begins to sound like we, uh, a conspiracy movie. Maybe things really are like that, but I don't know who pulls the strings. I don't know who even wrote my paycheck. Lazar insists that he is still working to provide proof of his claims. It is something I'm going to pursue. I have people that can verify everything. No offense or buts. And I can't wait to prove it all. To date, Lazar has yet to produce such verification. The History Channel submitted a request to the Air Force for an interview regarding Area 51, but the request was denied. The Air Force maintains that all operations there are classified. Every year since the 1994 lawsuit, the President of the United States has renewed Area 51's top secret status, making it inevitable that the criticism and speculation will continue. Certainly there are things there that have to be kept secret, but the idea of a total blackout of a certain place frightens a lot of citizens. For many, the questions remain. Does Area 51 represent the cutting edge of aviation engineering, or is the source of its most innovative technology otherworldly? So as the years go on, we'll find out what some of these are. It's what makes the place uh, of increasing and you know, constant interest. You never know what might come out of there. You know, it's the age-old question. We all want to know where we came from and what we're doing here. You know, some people view this almost as a religion, that if there is another life form out there running around, it's probably been out here longer than we are. Maybe Area 51 it has answers to some of those questions. The following program presents theories about an historical event that is shrouded in mystery. It contains archival footage, reenactments, and dramatizations, which invite you, the viewer, to draw your own conclusions. For nearly 20 years, UFO researchers and the government have disputed the authenticity of these documents. To some, they are proof of a UFO cover-up. To others, elaborate forgeries. If the press went after this story, we'd have a cosmic Watergate. Is this conclusive evidence that an alien spacecraft crashed near Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, and that the US government covered it up? The Roswell case is just one of many instances in which the US military baked it, the press served it, and the public ate it. These documents, if they exist, are hugely important if they exist and are authentic. This proves everything. These papers suggest that the Roswell cover-up was hatched by the military and perpetuated by an elite government committee. This group, codenamed Majestic 12, or MJ-12, answered to no one but the President of the United States. The government claims these documents are fakes and that MJ-12 never existed. The MJ-12 documents, they don't really prove anything. Almost everybody who's seen it says, you know, this is, this is garbage. The evidence that I see tells me of the probability of an MJ-12 type of organization that very likely does exist. In all likelihood, it exists beyond the strict laws of the United States. Just how far would our government go to deceive the public about the Roswell incident? Did the intelligence services of the United States find things and keep them hidden? There was a cover-up. We're not going to die, die that. The story begins in the Los Angeles area in December of 1984 with the arrival of a mysterious package. 
fledgling movie director Jamie Chandere is developing a fictional film about UFOs. He comes home one day to find an envelope postmarked Albuquerque, New Mexico. It has no return address and contains no message, only a single roll of film. Once processed, the film reveals a set of official-looking documents. One is dated September 24th, 1947, and marked Top Secret, Eyes Only. It appears to have been written and signed by President Harry Truman. This letter has come to be known as the Truman Forrestal Memo. The Truman Forrestal Memo is a memo from President Truman to First Secretary of Defense James Forrestal, telling him to go ahead with Operation Majestic 12 and that it would continue to be accountable only to the president. The term Majestic 12 is also referenced in the second document found on the film. Taken at face value, it presents an agenda for a briefing for President-elect Dwight Eisenhower. The document appears to have been prepared by Admiral Roscoe Hillencoater, former director of the CIA, and is dated November 18, 1952, more than five years after the Truman Forrestal memo. Essentially, the message you get in these documents is that the U.S. retrieved alien technology through more than one crash, including Roswell, that the extraterrestrial presence is real and here on Earth, and furthermore, that um, the United States government has had communication with, ex with an extraterrestrial being. This memo, which becomes known as the Eisenhower Briefing Document, identifies the Majestic 12 Committee, or MJ-12, as a group of high-level scientists, military leaders, and intelligence officers. The memo indicates that these 12 men have been granted the nation's highest security clearance to investigate the 1947 crash of an alien spacecraft. For years, rumors have swirled within the UFO research community that such a top-secret panel had hidden the truth about Roswell, but no one has ever found what appears to be hard evidence until now. Chandray enlists the help of fellow UFO researchers Bill Moore and Stanton Friedman. They spend the next three years trying to authenticate the MJ-12 documents. They started looking into this, thinking that this could be the holy grail, you know, the proof of UFO cover-up. Still, Stan Friedman advises that they proceed with caution. A physicist who has worked for defense contractors, Friedman is aware that his credibility could be damaged if the documents are found to be fake. That's all we need is, uh, you know, some hoaxer thinking he's going to get one up on us and say, gotcha, kind of thing. Slowly, Friedman pieces together a history of the Majestic 12 from the information contained in the Eisenhower briefing document and the Truman Forrestal memo. It took me years to verify some of the things in the document, dates, obscure things. But it's the trivia that matters. Because your first thought is, OK, somebody on the outside made up these documents. How did the person who made the documents know not to do this, to do this? Friedman will come to believe that the documents are evidence of a conspiracy that originated at the highest levels of the US government. According to the documents, the history of Operation Majestic 12 begins with the astonishing eyewitness account of Kenneth Arnold. In June 1947, Arnold, a civilian pilot, sees bright objects flash across the sky during a flight in Washington state. The press newspaper got this, and uh, Arnold had said that they, they moved as though like they were saucers skipping on the water and that phrase got turned into flying saucers. Arnold's sighting makes front page news. In the days that follow, several hundred sightings of flying objects are recorded across the country. In the midst of that, two weeks later, occurred the alleged crash of an object about 75 miles outside Roswell Army Airfield. On July 7, 1947, Investigators from Roswell Army Air Base are summoned to remote southeastern New Mexico. Rancher Mac Brazel claims he has stumbled on the wreckage of a downed flying saucer. 
They sort through debris scattered over nearly a mile of scrubland. It's unlike anything they've ever seen. Here's just all this strange stuff. Metal that was extraordinarily strong and extraordinarily lightweight. You could fold it and fold it and fold it, and then it would unfold on its own, memory metal. It's strange pastel figures on the inside of the I-beam-like pieces. People call them hieroglyphics, because what else could you call them if they weren't letters? The two army officers pack up crate loads of debris and return to Roswell Army Air Base the next morning. What is it? The base commander dictates a press release. The statement reads in part, Roswell Army Airfield was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc. At some point, Rancher Mac Brazel reportedly enters a coffee shop in Roswell and strikes up a conversation with another patron. Brazel shares his story about the flying saucer crash. That man happens to manage a local radio station, and he immediately calls sister station KOAT in Albuquerque. The station's secretary begins to dispatch a teletype message to an ABC station in California. But, as she will claim years later, her missive is interrupted. She was putting it out on the wire. And suddenly a bell rings on the machine, and the FBI says, do not continue this transmission. Nevertheless, the official statement made at Roswell Army Air Base reaches the Associated Press that afternoon. By 2.30, the story had hit the AP news wires and all hell broke loose. The incredible story becomes national news, if only for a few days. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army it will stir controversy for decades to come. According to mysterious papers known as the MJ-12 documents, on July 7, 1947, an operation to recover wreckage and bodies from a crashed alien spacecraft is launched outside Roswell, New Mexico. By July 8th, search teams have descended on a giant debris field and sealed off nearby roadways. A major retrieval operation is underway. There have been claims, though, that there were these bodies that were found. This is one of the statements made in the, the MJ-12 documents that are so controversial. According to the Eisenhower briefing document, four dead and badly decomposed aliens are also recovered and removed for study. The Roswell Army Air Base commander instructs Major Jesse Marcel to transport the debris to Wright Field in Ohio. First, however, the plane makes a scheduled stop at Fort Worth Army Airfield in Texas under the command of Brigadier General Roger Ramey. UFO researcher Stanton Friedman alleges that two-star General Clemens McMullen phones Ramey's assistant from Washington and issues three orders. Get the press off our back. I don't care how you do it. Send some of that wreckage up here with one of your colonel couriers today. And the third was, I don't want you ever to talk about it again. So Marcel arrived in Fort Worth with this stuff, showed it to Ramey. According to Marcel, the two men walked out of the main room. When they came back in, there was different material there, torn up weather balloon, totally identifiable, conventional stuff. And it was that material with which Marcel was photographed with in that famous picture where he's holding this wreckage and basically made to look like an idiot. Ramey told the press, sorry, it was just a radar reflector weather balloon combination, you know, which is an insult to anybody's intelligence. The notion that people at Roswell didn't know about weather balloons is pretty darn silly. They were used all the time. Ramey also tells reporters that the second leg of this flight, carrying these materials to Wright Field in Ohio, has been canceled. UFO researchers believe that is a lie. We have an FBI memo, however, that confirms material was taken to Wright Field uh, for, for study, for analysis. 
According to Stanton Friedman, the presumed cargo on this flight consists of some flying saucer wreckage from the crash site. No documentation has been found identifying specifically what was airlifted to Wright Field. What is known is that the press reports the Army's weather balloon cover story. And by the middle of July of 1947, press coverage of flying saucers in general just fell off a shelf. Rancher Mac Brazel had supposedly seen the wreckage of a spacecraft. According to his son, Brazel is detained for several days by military police. I'm listening to you. His son alleges that Army officials pressure the rancher until he finally swears to secrecy. Brazel will refuse to publicly discuss what he saw near Roswell for the rest of his life. If the Majestic 12 documents are to be believed, the cover-up was a success. But UFO researchers claim the government still needed to contain speculation that something extraordinary happened near Roswell, that aliens had pierced some of the nation's most sensitive airspace. They believe President Harry Truman authorizes a strategy to quell any remaining suspicions. Let's face it. If the United States government recovered crash flying saucers in New Mexico, you would want to cover it all up. The Majestic 12 documents indicate that on September 24, 1947, President Truman signed an executive order initiating the covert operation. But there is no record of any MJ-12 meeting, only those documents that surface in 1984. One, the so-called Truman Forrestal memo, suggests that Truman authorized the top secret project. Allegedly, the 12 members took responsibility for a cover-up begun by the Army. Then there's the so-called Eisenhower briefing document, which indicates that the members of MJ-12 were tasked with investigating and exploiting the alien technology recovered from the crash site near Roswell. Exactly, UFO researchers say, the approach officials might be expected to take. The government, first of all, would want to know, are these guys hostile? Secondly, they wanted to know, how do these things work? If you got wreckage, you want to figure out, what can I learn from this? What do you think one would do if you had access suddenly to something as exotic as alien technology? You would establish a super secret group of individuals with the right types of scientific and security clearances. And you would say, I assume, figure this out. Friedman contends that President Truman and the MJ-12 members were aware of the gravity of the situation. The Roswell crash meant that control over some of the most sensitive airspace in the US had been compromised. Some of the most classified places in the United States, which are in New Mexico, White Sands Missile Range, the 509th in Roswell was the most elite military group in the world. They dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At the dawn of the Cold War era, the stakes for national security had never been higher. The motivation for keeping this all secret in 1947 you know, we just won the Second World War. Um, the Russians were just getting excited about espionage. Robert Wood, a former aeronautics engineer, and his son Ryan are UFO researchers who learn of the MJ-12 documents from Stanton Friedman. They stress that in 1947, it was paramount that the government keep the Roswell incident under wraps. It's something that uh, I don't think people wanted to distract the public about. Um, it would highlight the fact that we can't control our airspace at all. Both Friedman and the Woods hope to uncover new material to authenticate the MJ-12 documents, but they don't even have the originals, only photographs of them. So, independently, they look for credible secondary sources that will prove the documents are real. Friedman begins with the list of supposed members of MJ-12. One of the first things we did, of course, was check on the list of 12, dates of birth, dates of death. Jerome Hunsaker, who was the last survivor, died in September 1984. 
just a couple months before we got the documents. Friedman believes the documents release may have been timed to coincide with Hunsaker's death. The supposed members of this elite panel were 12 of the most trusted and brilliant men from the military, scientific, and intelligence communities. Friedman believes that Truman and his close advisors selected them, and the 12 men had the highest security clearance. It is an impressive group. The Secretary of Defense, the first three directors of the CIA, an Air Force general who would later become head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary of the Army, and five of the nation's leading scientists at the time. One characteristic was clear. They all had worked on very high security stuff. Friedman is immediately intrigued by one name that appears on the list. Here's Donald Howard Menzel, who'd written three anti-UFO books, explained away every sighting, and yet he was supposedly on the inside. First of all, the objects are not unidentified. We know what they are. Second, in many cases, in most cases, they're not flying. And finally, in many cases, they are not even material objects. Dr. Donald Menzel, a Harvard astronomy professor who died in 1976, had earned a reputation as a determined debunker of UFOs. And yet, if the documents are correct, he also served on a top secret committee charged with covering up evidence of extraterrestrial crafts. Curious to learn more, Friedman obtains permission to examine the Harvard archives. I went up there and was totally shocked at what I found. He discovers that Menzel was more than just an academic. The astronomer consulted with the National Security Agency, known to be a super-secret intelligence organization. As proof, Friedman produces this letter from the Harvard archives that Menzel wrote to Senator John Kennedy in 1960, noting his long relationship with the NSA. Donald Menzel lived a double life. No one knew this at the time that the documents came out. If the government did have proof that UFOs existed, Friedman says, someone with these credentials would be in on the secret. But others scoff at the notion that Menzel's work for the government included covering up the existence of UFOs. In an email to the History Channel, his daughter says the contention that her father was involved in the, quote, fictitious program called MJ-12 is patently ludicrous. Friedman is used to such criticism. He acknowledges that he has not found any direct evidence linking Menzel to Operation Majestic 12. We're dealing with a top secret project. There was nothing in the Menzel papers at Harvard that was still classified. And one wouldn't expect a guy who spent more than 30 years of his life working on very highly classified materials to leave anything around about that. Despite the lack of direct evidence, UFO researchers believe Menzel's government work is a tantalizing clue. It won't be the last one they uncover. All right, take a look at these signatures. He signs in the same place. By 1985, as UFO researchers delve more deeply into declassified government records, Stanton Friedman believes they found even more convincing evidence that the Majestic 12 documents are real. The only other possibility, he claims, is that he and other researchers are the victims of an elaborate hoax. A few months after Jamie Chandray reportedly receives the package containing the filmed MJ-12 documents, another anonymous message appears. In early 1985, Bill Moore, a UFO researcher in California, gets a postcard, postmarked New Zealand. Its cryptic message suggests he visit the National Archives outside Washington, D.C. and look up Box 189. And it was clear somebody wanted us to go to Washington. You don't ignore instructions like that. For Chandere, Moore, and Friedman, it's a promising lead. They've already spent years reading declassified material and are skilled at navigating the National Archives. So Chandere and Moore go to Washington and examine Box 189. They find a document that, to them, supports the existence of the MJ-12. 
they found the Cutler Twining memo. Folded over between two folders, it obviously didn't belong there, and they called me that night and read it to me. And it immediately rang a bell with me. The note appears to have been written in July 1954 by Robert Cutler, Special Assistant for National Security Affairs, to President Eisenhower. The formally classified document announces an upcoming Majestic 12 briefing. It is addressed to General Nathan Twining, one of the supposed members of the Majestic 12. The Cutler Twining memo is particularly important because it's an original document. Friedman believes the memo was planted in the archives by an insider, someone who wanted the information leaked. I asked the people at the archives what the history of that box was. I'm told that that box, 189, was first handled in late September 1984 two weeks after the death of Jerome Hunsaker, the last survivor. Coincidence, of course. Through 1986, Friedman continues to search for hard evidence that will substantiate the MJ-12 documents. What he finds is only circumstantial, but combined, it makes what he believes is a convincing case for their authenticity. First, the documents say that Defense Secretary James Forrestal and nuclear scientist Vannevar Bush were members of this top secret committee. The Truman Forrestal memo, supposedly signed on September 24, 1947, comports with official records of a meeting between President Harry Truman, James Forrestal, and Vannevar Bush on that day. This is the only date in reality that Harry Truman met uh, in a, within a six-month period of time with Vannevar Bush. Vannevar Bush met with James Forrestal on September 24, 1947. A second detail is found in the Eisenhower briefing document. It's also interesting that the date of the Eisenhower briefing document, that is November 18, 1952, it just so happens that uh, President-elect Dwight Eisenhower on that day did receive a 45-minute long briefing during which General Nathan Twining, another alleged MJ-12 member, was present. A third detail. The briefing document states that on July 7, 1947, a secret operation was launched to recover wreckage near Roswell for scientific study. Friedman contends that flight logs he has obtained show on that same date, General Nathan Twining boarded a plane from Wright Field in Ohio to Alamogordo Army Airfield, New Mexico, about 115 miles from Roswell. He was already there on the 7th, and that's the day where the document says work began. Twining's flight logs place him in New Mexico until July 11th. Whatever the purpose of his visit, Friedman says this letter proves that Twining canceled other plans in order to make the New Mexico trip. He had sent a letter to a buddy at Boeing. They used to like do fishing trips and things like that. Sorry, something of great importance had come up. That's when he went to New Mexico. There is another intriguing coincidence. In March 1949, Defense Secretary James Forrestal, a supposed member of the Majestic 12, resigns from President Truman's cabinet. In April, he is admitted into Bethesda Naval Hospital for treatment for mental illness. On May 22, 1949, seven weeks after checking in, Forrestal plunges to his death from a window on the hospital's 16th floor. The official cause of death is suicide, but Forrestal's fall has long been the subject of speculation. I don't think we'll ever know the true story of what happened. The theories are many. He was pushed out, he was tossed out. They decided he was gonna talk about things he shouldn't be talking about. By the spring of 1987, Friedman and his colleagues feel compelled to make their findings public. The result is national media coverage, including on the ABC News program Nightline, where Friedman debates the existence of MJ-12 with skeptic Phil Klass, a journalist and founding member of the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, or PSYCOP. Klass issues a challenge to the national media to investigate the MJ-12 documents and within a month come back and report either these documents are authentic, we have captured a crime, 
a flying saucer, the government has maintained a cover-up for 40 years, or come back and report it's nonsense and there has never been so great a con job done against the news media and the public. I think that the uh, people who want to keep secrets have done a very good job of taking advantage well, of the egos of the Washington press corps who think that no secrets can be kept from them. Nearly 20 years later, skepticism remains. Paul Kurtz, now head PSYCOP, founded at the State University of New York at Buffalo. On the MJ-12, there were 12 people on this special committee, and they're all dead now. If after the fact you're going to create a commission or a committee out of fiction, then it's convenient to put dead people on it, so you cannot question them. The MJ-12 documents are third-rate amateurish productions, in my opinion, and I say this as someone who's, who's looked at some very good forgeries for over decades. Joe Nickel, a PSYCOP investigator, takes issue with the fact that only photocopies of the Eisenhower briefing document and the Truman Forrestal memo are available for analysis, not the originals. Where are these original alleged documents? The rule of best evidence says that you don't use a copy of something when the original could be available. Despite these limitations, Nickel agreed to study copies of the supposed Majestic 12 documents. And they're hugely problematical, riddled with factual errors and even uh, document errors, riddled with them. Nickel begins by dissecting the Truman Forrestal memo. If Friedman and his supporters are to be believed, this memo marked the launch of Operation Majestic 12. It mentions a executive order number. We can go to the Truman files and look up his executive order numbers, and this isn't one of them. When we get to the signature, it gets even worse. This is a cut and paste job. This was Xerox copy that had been interposed on something that had been typewritten. The signature is genuine, but the evidence suggests it was a fabrication. Stylistic errors, like incorrect date formats, also expose the Eisenhower briefing paper as a fraud, Nickel argues. The Eisenhower briefing document is a problem on several levels, but one that caught my attention was the, the date format, which is really incorrect. The civilian date would be November 18, 1952. The military format would be 18 November 1952, no comma. But the briefing document has a hybrid. I think this is one of many touches of incompetence in these documents. If the first two alleged Majestic 12 documents are fakes, then what about the Cutler-Twining memo that was discovered at the National Archives? Nickel learns that the alleged author, Robert Cutler, was not even in the U.S. when the memo was supposedly written. He had left for Europe 11 days earlier. Equally suspicious, Nickel argues, is the fact that the Cutler-Twining memo, like the other documents, was discovered by UFO researchers. The National Archives didn't have any record of it, didn't know they had it. Nice try, fellas, but this is not a very credible document. Nickel does not rule out the possibility that one of the memo's proponents, Stanton Friedman, Moore, or Chandray, planted the document there to make it look authentic. They're not expecting you to bring a George Washington letter into the archives. No, they're worried about you putting one in your briefcase or something and walking out with it. But Friedman defends his work on MJ-12. He says his research has unearthed many official documents with date formatting inconsistencies. And Friedman has a response to Nickel and others who would suggest that the Cutler-Twining memo was planted. The guys who had the best opportunity to plant it were the lawyers and other people who spend their time in the Army Reserve working on declassification. They have to have high-level clearances. Otherwise, they don't get access to this stuff. While the debate persists about whether the government instigated a massive cover-up about Roswell, UFO stories gain widespread popularity, due in part to Stanton Friedman's charges. In late 1993, at the urging of constituents, New Mexico Congressman Steve Schiff demands a federal inquiry into the records of the Roswell incident. The investigation that follows will help blow the lid off a U.S. Air Force secret 
that's been tightly guarded for 46 years. Something happened near Roswell in 1947. The question is, what exactly happened? March 1994. In Washington, D.C., a congressional inquiry explores government records of a crash near Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. Some UFO researchers hope that the inquiry will unearth evidence of a cover-up of a crash of an alien spacecraft, a cover-up which they believe is spearheaded by a secret government council called the MJ-12. The General Accounting Office, the investigative arm of Congress, handles the fact-finding mission. It audits the FBI, CIA, Air Force, and other agencies for records of the so-called Roswell incident. The pro-Roswell people, if you will, have for years uh, said it was the Air Force that had, quote, covered this, this whole incident up. Colonel Richard Weaver oversees the Air Force's role in the investigation. Military records, according to Weaver, contain nothing to suggest that an alien spacecraft crashed near Roswell. There just wasn't a recognition that this was anything extraterrestrial. The Air Force's focus was really on, are these really Russian type of flying objects? If that was the case, they were flying with impunity over our skies. However, Weaver does discover that the official explanation for the Roswell crash site debris that it was a weather balloon is not true. But UFO researchers claim that this story is just another part of a disinformation campaign that was underway in July 1947. Deep in the Air Force records is the mention of a covert operation called Project Mogul. Launched in 1946, at the onset of the Cold War, Mogul experimented with spy balloons that could monitor Soviet nuclear testing. We were trying to spy on the Russians. It was the only way that we had at that time in 1947 because there were no satellites. There were no possibilities of overflights in, in that area. There were no human resources on the ground that we could get that information from. So it was an attempt to get, gather information through kind of a novel method. In fact, Weaver learns that a Project Mogul spy balloon went missing near Roswell in early July, just days before rancher Matt Brazel stumbled upon the alleged alien crash site. Yes, there was a cover-up. It was not of, of a spacecraft from outer space, and it was not of Little Green People. It was of the technology that we had developed in the Cold War to detect nuclear energy. Weaver compiles a report that includes his findings on Project Mogul. The Air Force releases it to the public in September 1994, adding that no Air Force documents reveal a cover-up or any evidence of alien bodies or extraterrestrial materials. However, the GAO, or General Accounting Office probe, is still in progress and has not yet published any of its own findings. The result? Critics charge that Weaver and the Air Force are still perpetuating a cover-up that began back in 1947. This was a, a preemptive strike uh, against the GAO report. Someone in the Air Force decided that the best way to cut them off at the pass was to do their own report. Mark Rodiger is scientific director of the Center for UFO Studies, a group of scientists, academics, and investigators interested in promoting serious scientific interest in UFOs. He argues that Project Mogul is one more ploy to misinform the public about Roswell. There is no way that the amount of material in a Mogul balloon would fill up the area as described by the witnesses on the Roswell debris field. Now, right there, that's enough for me. Even though Rodiger doubts that the MJ-12 documents are authentic, he believes it is possible that aliens did crash near Roswell. And he disputes Weaver's assumption that anyone would mistake a crash balloon for an alien spacecraft. People found mogul balloons out there all the time. In fact, mogul balloons often had out, written on them who to return it to. In July 1995, nearly a year after the release of Weaver's report, the General Accounting Office completes its inquiry into government records regarding Roswell. The GAO concludes, in part, 
that the year-long investigation has found two records from 1947 that acknowledge a crash. Both claim the object was a balloon. The report finds no other records of a crash near Roswell. UFO researchers may be disappointed, but not surprised. They didn't try to determine whether the Roswell event was real. They simply looked for existing records, and they basically could find almost nothing. Rodiger argues that the General Accounting Office lacks the muscle to make the FBI, CIA, or any other agency turn over top secret files. What is indisputable is that the GAO inquiry does reveal one suspicious fact. Many records at the Roswell Army Airfield from 1947, permanent records that were supposed to be preserved, had been destroyed years before. Is this evidence of a government cover-up? What the General Accounting Office discovered, this is an amazing thing, was that all outgoing messages from Roswell Army Airfield from the middle of from early 1946 to the end of 1949 were inexplicably missing. They were just gone. These documents are the only hard evidence that an elite government committee called the Majestic 12 ever existed. Skeptics say they are fraudulent. But UFO researchers believe other records could have confirmed the existence of the MJ-12. They say those documents may have been destroyed as part of a government cover-up. Jamie Chandore and William Moore, the original recipients of the documents, no longer comment publicly on the Majestic 12. But in an email to the History Channel, Moore said that if the documents are a hoax, he suspects it was perpetrated to discredit Roswell investigators. Fellow researchers agree. One of the key questions you have to ask yourself about these documents is, did somebody manufacture them? Are they all fake? And you have to say, well, why fake them? What's the motivation for faking them? Is it to fool the UFO community? Ah, oh, nobody cares about the UFO community. Is it to make fame and fortune? Nobody's made any fame and fortune out of it. The answer could be it's government disinformation of the most insidious kind to take us off the path of what could be the truth. In fact, UFO researchers' quest for the truth about Roswell and Operation Majestic 12 may be hopelessly compromised by the intense secrecy of the Cold War era. If you take yourself back to 1947, the Cold War was just beginning with the Soviets. Uh, it was a time when uh, we had lots of secrets we were keeping and, and more secrets were going to be kept as years went by. In December 1947, Five months after the Roswell incident, the Air Force did establish a secret committee staffed by elite scientists and military officers. That operation eventually became known as Project Blue Book. Headquartered at Patterson Field in Ohio, its mission was to investigate all reported UFO sightings and determine if they pose a threat to national security. UFO reports could clog reporting channels for military communications and so forth, and the Soviets could use it for deception operations. The government decided that UFO sightings had to be explained at all cost, and that UFO reports had to be debunked. But to some, Blue Book's very existence validated claims that alien spacecraft may have been credible. In 1969, after a 22-year tenure, Blue Book was terminated. Air Force officials deny that extraterrestrial aircraft were ever found. Some UFO researchers are not surprised, since they claim Project Blue Book was never meant to expose the truth about UFOs. It wasn't some kind of deep black deception. It was instead a very open deception, if, you, if you, we can put it that way, a public relations effort to convince the public there was nothing to UFOs. In the years since a mysterious roll of film brought the Majestic 12 controversy to light, Roswell, New Mexico has become an iconic place in American culture. Whether or not an alien spaceship really crashed there almost seems beside the point. But the debate over the authenticity of the MJ-12 documents rages on. Do these papers open a Pandora's box of nefarious government secrets? Are they fakes that merely showcase the handiwork of a determined con artist? Or is there a third option? 
that the documents are part of an elaborate government-sponsored disinformation campaign designed to keep Americans in the dark about UFOs. Some people say, oh, that's a crude hoax. Well, if it's a hoax, it sure ain't crude. Those documents are quite sophisticated. I mean, there's a lot of information in those documents that when they came out in 1984 in the form of a, a canister of film, were not known or widely understood at the time. I've now been to 20 different document archives across the country. I get a real kick out of the people who say, this document must be phony. I say it from their armchair instead of going to the archives and finding other documents with the same idiosyncrasies. But despite the efforts of some UFO researchers to have the MJ-12 documents taken seriously, Richard Dolan insists that the existence of MJ-12 doesn't necessarily hinge on their validity. You look at the MJ-12 documents, and to accept them blindly as real, I think, is premature. On the other hand, I think that there is reason to consider them valid. I do. I would argue that however one perceives the, the, uh, the authenticity of those documents, that uh, it is entirely logical and likely that an MJ-12 type of group did indeed exist. Skeptics say that UFO researchers have engendered a debate based on spurious logic and flimsy evidence. And in doing so, they've behaved at best irresponsibly. I think the public should be outraged over MJ-12. It was not just a fun and games, but it's caused a lot of people to um, distrust the American government. It's caused people to sus have suspicions about historical figures that are unjustified. In June 2004, New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson said that the official investigations have never adequately explained the crash near Roswell. He called for a full disclosure of what the government knows. Will another inquiry reveal the MJ-12 documents to be proof of one of the greatest government cover-ups of all time? Or will it perpetuate the public's willingness to believe? The preceding program presented theories about an historical event that is shrouded in mystery. It contained archival footage, reenactments, and dramatizations, which invite you, the viewer, to draw your own conclusions.